Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with uh, yet another episode of THD Podcast. Today, joining us from the Bay Area, we have a haptic motor technology called Taction Technology. So we're going to find out all about their technology and how to apply it and what kind of products it can be used in. Uh, but let's not forget to give a shout out to our sponsor, the Alti Association, the Audio Loudspeaker Technology International. Um, they have a, they're going to be at the Munich automotive show coming up. And also they have their own show just, uh, coming prior to Infocom in Vegas as well in June. So please encourage everybody to get out and check out those events, but without delay, let's say hello, Simon in Japan, as always, how are you doing this morning, Simon? Good morning, Dave. Uh, good evening, John, is it? <laughs> yeah, afternoon, close enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so John Steinberg from Taction Technology in the Bay Area. Thanks for joining us today, John. How are you? Happy to be with you. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, uh, haptic technology, adding you know vibration motors into devices has been around in, uh, you know, people feel their mobile phone rumble on their desk when they've got their ringers turned off. It's kind of like a, a really popular type of haptic motor. But uh, you guys are kind of focusing more on enhancing an audio experience with your technology. So um, maybe you want to, how, how do you want, do you want to tell us a, a little bit about where the company came from and how you ended up here? Or do you have a presentation or how would you like to step through this? Um, so we, we, we can do this however um, you like, Dave. I have some slides I'd be happy to, to talk you through or we can, or we can just talk. Okay, well, let's, yeah, let's jump through some slides and then it gives us some visuals for the people watching to, uh, to make sense of what we're talking about. So the two things I thought would be useful for us to talk about here are um, sort of the why. Um, why. Why are we talking about haptics? Why are haptics something that uh, people in the audio space and, and in other applications should really be thinking about? Um, and then a little bit about why are our own transducer we think is superior to everything else uh, that's available on the market at this point. So I, it really makes sense, I think, in talking about all this kind of to go back to first principles um, because it helps make the, the need for haptics, I think, pretty obvious. So in the audio world, uh, there's a pretty well-established model for how people think about the way human beings experience sound. There's waves in the air um, that pressurize, alternately pressurize and rarify the air. It goes into the canal of the ear, pushes on the eardrum and so on and so forth. And your body interprets this um, as sound. And it's true as far as it goes, but it's not the entire story. Now, of course, we're uh, very well equipped at this point to measure that understanding of sound. Um, most people who are uh, serious in the space have something like a, a hat, either the B and K or, or a different variation on this to do uh, headphone measurements. Um, and the, the kinds of uh, specifications that people think about, that people compare basic technologies on are pretty well established. You look at frequency response, um, distortion, of course, does it pass square waves, those sorts of things. This is all very well understood. But along the way, we've kind of forgotten about something, I think, pretty important. Um, anyone who's been around long enough to remember what uh, receivers and amplifiers looked like in, in the home audio space way back in like the 70s and 80s will remember seeing this funny button, um, usually near the volume control, that says loudness. Mm -hmm. um, and that had a really important um, function that, again, people kind of understood then, but is sort of lost in the world of audio today. Um, and that's about the well-understood fact that your ears are much less sensitive to low-frequency sounds than they are to mid-range and high-frequency sounds. And that's something um, that shows up in something, again, where I think most people who are probably uh, sitting through this will be familiar with the, the Fletcher-Munson curves, um, which are essentially a, a graphic representation of the way uh, your ear is much less sensitive um, to very low frequency sound than it is to mid-range and high frequency sound. Um, and again, people don't talk about this much anymore, but this is not a small difference. Um, you know, the, the, the difference between uh, 77 dB 
and 30 dB, which are e equivalent on those two frequencies, um, that's actually more than a thousand times different um, because of the logarithmic nature of the decibel scale. So this is a huge thing. Um, and so uh, a headphone, a speaker that measures flat um, may not be experienced as flat, um, particularly with headphones. Mm -hmm. um, and okay, are, are low frequency sounds uh, important? Um, well, in almost everything that uh, people normally listen to, yeah, it really is. Even just a standard piano goes down below 30 hertz. Um, electronic music goes down further still. And then if you're doing you know, gaming and, and, and soundtracks, um, it can go much lower than that. And all of these things um, are, are important. Um, there was this great quote that I found online that sort of gets to why this stuff is important. Before the invention of speakers that could project true bass frequencies, humans really only came across bass in hazardous situations. For example, when thunder struck or an earthquake shook or from explosions caused by dynamite or gunpowder. That's probably why it is by far the most adrenaline producing frequency that we have. Um, so this adds a great deal to the realism of pretty much everything we listen to. And, and we think it's a big part of where, where the goosebumps come from, where, where the oh wow in, in listening to something can be found. So how do you get that aspect of sound? Well, uh, most people are familiar with the old saying about how if you hold your nose and bite into either an apple or an onion, you can't tell the difference between the two. Um, and that's because you don't just taste food with your taste buds. Your, your, another sense, your sense of smell, is a key part of how you experience food. Um, well, it's the same thing with sound. Your skin, um, the pressure waves hitting your body um, are also a key part of how you experience low frequency sound. And so the, the reason why we do what we do is because we can supply what's missing. Tactile drivers can give you the missing part of that experience. So that's the good news, it can be done. The even better news um, is how well tactile and acoustic go together in your sort of overall perceptual apparatus. Um, if you plot um, your, your ear sensitivity, the red is, is in effect the inverse of the fletcher munson curve. And then you plot your, your sensitivity to tactile stimuli. Um, this is more or less what it looks like. And they kind of go together like a woofer and a tweeter. It looks, you know, it looks like a crossover. Um, so it can be done and it can give you a really good, much fuller experience. However, it's not as easy as it looks. And, and tact, uh, tactile drivers, haptic drivers are much more sort of at the beginning of the learning curve, particularly in the audio world, compared to uh, normal acoustic drivers, which you know are pretty well understood at this point. Um, so uh, the, the, the kinds of drivers that people have been using to do uh, haptics for, for many years, um, there's two kinds of electro, uh, electromechanical motors that people have been using for years for these kinds of applications. Um, in things like gaming controllers, uh, there have been a lot of what they call eccentric rotating mass motors. Mm -hmm. um, and then in headphones and, and, and cell phones, uh, ERMs have also been in cell phones. But uh, another one that's been in cell phones and in a bunch of headphones is called the linear resonant actuator. And let me talk a little bit about um, each of those. So what they all have in common with, with us and everything else out there um, is the idea that we're trying to create motion in the skin, which stimulates certain nerves that are optimized for, in effect, receiving that signal for, for sensing vibration. And then that gets sent to the brain. The trick, um, one of the tricks, is to make your brain integrate that into sound so that it's relatively seamless. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get to a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, uh, Obviously, anytime we're going to try and do something like this in, in, in a sort of measurements driven world like audio, you want to know, well, is this something that we can measure? Can we, how, how can we compare these things? Um, 
Well, uh, this is something we've actually devoted a fair amount of attention to. Um, and we have a bunch of our own tools that we've developed that we can make available to partners um, for measuring the tactile output of um, bear drivers and also of headphones. And what you're looking at here um, is the headphone test kit that we supply to partners, um, which lets you do those measurements. Okay. Um, now, now that said, um, one of the things that uh, we've learned sort of the hard way um, although you can quantify that way, it's important to realize that with the, the hats that most people use, the measurements that you get on the, uh, on the sort of the hard plastic of, the, of that head are not, don't map perfectly to what happens on your skin, which is soft and moves and all of that. But again, we know a lot about how to, how to make that work properly. Um, the, the test equipment, the, the, the transducer that we make, um, a lot of the science behind this comes from our founder, uh, James Biggs, who's been working in this space literally for decades. Um, he was a key player in one of the early uh, haptic transducers that got used in, um, in headphones uh, from a company called Vivitouch. Um, that was an electroactive polymer. It was a very different technology. Uh, but he's been involved in this space uh, for a long time. Um, and he's pretty much a, a bona fide uh, rocket surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's talk a little bit about how we measure this. Um, so um, the easiest way to measure is using those accelerometers that I showed you that were mounted on that headphone. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have found that there's sort of a perceptual threshold below which um, you're, you don't really notice that the transducer is doing anything. Um, and that's where we put the, the, the blue bars here. Um, and so uh, a, a waveform that's larger than that uh, is perceptible. A waveform that, that doesn't accelerate that fast is largely imperceptible. Okay. So with all that as, as set up, now let's talk about the, these other uh, kinds of devices. So um, I'm guessing everybody who's going to be watching this uh, video is going to be familiar with how LRAs work. There's a mass suspended on a spring um, and it moves back and forth, kind of like uh, uh, a dynamic driver in a, in a loudspeaker, mm -hmm. um, except it's got a heavy mass uh, attached to it to try and lower the resonance. Um, one of the key characteristics of these things is right there in the name, um, they are resonant. It's, it's sort of what makes them uh, attractive in applications like cell phones because you get a very strong output at the resonant frequency for relatively little uh, electrical budget. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the side effect of that is the, it's, the, it's this incredibly narrow frequency output. In effect, it's ringing like a bell. Um, and uh, the resonant peak is so sharp that even like one note down or up on the piano is a big fall off in the output um, of the transducer. We, we heard this uh, sort of funny, sad story from one, uh, one headphone company that we talked to a, a while back about how they put an LRA in their headphone that was designed for a very specific video game. And the mm -hmm. video game, uh, uh, the, the video game house, their, sound designer said, we're going to put this one sound effect at exactly this frequency. So tune your LRA to that frequency. And they tuned the LRA to that frequency. And by the time the game was published, they had moved the sound effect and mm -hmm. it was no longer at that resonant frequency. And so the LRA did almost nothing. Um, right. So that that's a, it's, and you know, there are the same kinds of issues with things like manufacturing tolerances. It's a very narrow window to make an LRA work. Um, another thing that's uh, really important, sort of a, a freebie here for people, um, uh, the headphones that many of the headphones that we've seen that use LRAs um, mount them so that the movement of the driver is like this. Um, and what that does is it turns the entire cup of the headphone into a plunger on your ear. Um, it moves the whole cup in and out, pressurizing the air inside the cup and then rarefying it. Mm -hmm. um, and what that results in is huge interaction effects with the acoustic output um, of the headphone. And so you get um, some pretty wild 
uh, frequency response aberrations where you, some places you have cancellation, some places you have reinforcement. Uh, it can be a mess. Um, so it's, it's literally the creating a moving target to get the acoustics accurate. Yeah. You're changing like, the distance between the acoustic driver and your yeah. eardrum. Uh, with, yeah. That's exactly the, right. Yes. Yeah, the point source keeps moving. Okay. Um, just, um, just to, just to may, maybe you're going to get into this, but it seems like what, what you're coming to here is that the, the haptic motor is kind of a supplementary and, and you would tune it in the system. So you have the acoustic drivers that are creating some sort of sense of, of low frequency, and then you're going to be able to enhance that in kind of a, a mix in the system with the haptic so that people get the sensation of lower frequencies. Is that kind of in a nutshell? Exactly right. I mean, you can you can think of it as um, a form of a subwoofer, and just right. as it's really important to design the crossover correctly and to get the mm -hmm. phase correct of the drivers in you know as as they uh, as they blend to make them work together properly, it's very much the same thing uh, with uh, with tuning. Uh, a, a, a haptic driver to go with the acoustic drivers <laughs> with the, the, the added complication, as, as you mentioned a, a minute ago, Dave, that uh, um, we may be moving the speaker closer to and further away from your head, which, you know, causes problems uh, not, not often seen in, <laughs> in loudspeakers. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, with the, the, the sort of measurement framework that I was just describing, uh, when we use accelerometers to try and measure uh, the acoustic output of an LRA, one of the things I, I, I didn't mention earlier, um, LRAs, generally speaking, the mass is quite large relative to the force of the motor. Um, and so they don't have good impulse response. It takes them many cycles to spool up to the point where they have strong output. Um, and, uh, you know, what you see here. Um, is sort of ringing, um, but it never gets above the perceptual threshold. And this is in their preferred primary axis. So the, you know, the in-out axis. Um, so although they're doing something, you're not actually likely to perceive the vibration part of it, at least not in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we measure them in the other two axes, again, you don't get perceptible tactile output. However, um, in part because of the problem we were talking about a few minutes ago, you get lots of acoustic artifacts um, and you can see what's happening here. Um, we, we, the the um, uh, acoustic sensitivity window is a little smaller here because we're measuring on a different scale. Um, but you can see you get lots of acoustic output, um, which is not really what we want from a haptic driver. So those okay. just, uh, if, uh, could you just go back to graphs? Sure. These, these ones are uh, one more. Yeah, this uh, acceleration. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, just the sensation through your skin is this kind of like the y-axis is trying to represent that. Uh, but if it stays within that window, you actually can't feel it. It's right. So the, the first one we were talking about was, yeah. again, their preferred direction of motion, which is toward your ear and then away from your ear. Yep. Um, yep. And when we say forward, backward, we mean... Yep. Um, the direction we move uh, with our, our transducer and then, okay. you know, up and down. Perfect. And then that's um, the actual acoustic pressure is the last one. Yes, correct. Um, so LRAs actually, you know, they, they don't really deliver what you're hoping for. And, and um, you know, one of the things that, like I said, because of the, the strong resonance, one of the amazing things with headphones with the LRAs in them, um, is you can put the headphone on your head, not plugged into anything and tap on the ear cup and you hear bong because the LRA is resonating even without power because it's undamped. Um, so the ERM, I'm not sure if this has ever been used in headphones, but it's, it, it has been used and continues to be used in, in lots of other devices, including cell phones and gaming controllers and such. Um, and uh, in a sense, they have, uh, while they have some advantages, they have an even more restricted performance envelope than the LRA. Um, essentially, if you want more output, 
out of an ERM, the only way to get more output is to speed it up. Um, and so frequency and amplitude are tied. Um, and so a, uh, an ERM can produce output along the line, but it can't go you know, deeper and louder or higher in frequency and softer. Um, so uh, neither one of those, in our opinions, can be thought of as high fidelity haptic devices because the, perform because the performance envelopes are so limited. So um, of course, we're not the only people out there now uh, who are uh, offering um, more, more high fidelity uh, haptic devices. So let's talk a little bit about um, another one that's gotten some traction. Um, so uh, there's another uh, planar haptic transducer out there in a gaming headphone, and it offers much better frequency response than the ERMs or the LRAs. However, in, in the area in which you could call it reasonably flat, it's only about an octave and a half. Um, and it does not go into the deep bass. Um, it, it starts tapering off uh, at something like 70 or 60 hertz. Um, so finally, let's talk about ours. Um, so our founder, James Biggs, designed this from the outset to try and address that uh, deep space, uh, deep base, excuse me, area. Um, the, it, it is already found, uh, in, um, the Corsair HS60 haptic, uh, gaming headphone, which has gotten some really great reviews. Um, and our frequency response in the, in the HS60, um, is close to four octaves flat and go, goes flat down well below 20 Hertz. There's, there's, perceptible output down, down near 10 Hertz with ours. Um, and then when you do the same kind of measurements that we were talking about before with the, uh, with the LRA, um, you see, uh, first of all, that this is the kind of impulse response that you'd want to see out of an acoustic driver. You basically get one cycle, one and a half cycles of perceptible output, and then it drops below the perceptible threshold and the rise time is really good. So, um, uh, you know, you get a much faster response in addition to much deeper response. Um, we, we get perceptible output within just a, a handful of milliseconds, whereas it takes many, many cycles with an LRA. And then when you measure in the, the sort of uh, unintended uh, axes, nothing perceptible because we've designed our transducer and we work with our partners to make sure that there's minimal interaction um, in the way the transducer is mounted in the headphone cup, uh, minimal, minimal interaction with the acoustic output. Um, and so audio, again, no uh, one cycle, uh, no, um, no ringing, and it's below the perceptible threshold. So this is how um, we compare in terms of frequency response with that other uh, planar transducer. And you can see uh, that we're about the same sort of in the, in the area near their resonant frequency, um, but below that and above that, we have much more output, um, which is quantified um, here. Mm -hmm. uh, so outside of a, uh, of a headphone, just on a, on a bare test rig, this is what the frequency response looks like. Um, and then when you line up what we can do against an ERM and an LRA, you can see what a dramatic increase uh, in output it is. And of course we can, uh, ours, it's the area under the curve um, because in ours, um, the intensity and frequency are independent. Um, so here's a quick little sort of table summarizing uh, the differences between an off the shelf LRA and, and what we can do. Uh, much more power, um, uh, faster response, um, was a two or almost two orders of magnitude faster response, um, and flat frequency response instead of a strongly resonant output. So those are the things, um, that sort of in all acoustic, uh, applications we think are important to people. There's some other advantages 
uh, for for uh, gaming applications, for example, uh, that we think are also potentially very interesting. So obviously, esports has become a big deal. There's a lot of money there now, um, and so uh, you know, getting an edge over your opponent um, is worth money. Um, and uh, there is academic science, and we've done our own experiments. Um, that show that there's potentially a reaction time advantage in having a haptics enabled headphone. And the reason for that is that uh, the neural pathway for touch Mm -hmm. um, is actually faster to the brain than the neural pathway for sound. And I mean, it sort of, (laughs) it sort of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, You're uh, you know, out in the jungle, um, your survival depends on how fast you react. Um, getting touched by something that could kill you <laughs> really ought to be the thing that's, that's got the most priority in your brain. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so anyway, we think there's, a, there's significant potential advantages there. We, we've proved it with some studies. Um, we think there's also some very interesting opportunities to apply this technology in the world of VR headsets, which... Um, hasn't become what everyone says it's going to be yet, but I, I think we, we all remain optimistic that eventually that's going to happen. Um, and I, I think it's been fascinating to look at the way most VR headsets have been uh, sort of marketed. You know, you, you, you look at this picture of an early uh, Google device um, that they call virtual reality, but you'll notice that they're only addressing vision. That's the only mm-hmm. sense that they're trying to uh, in- engage here. I mean, it, it's sort of like, you know, going to a concert and not being able to listen to it. It's just mm-hmm. stuff moving. Uh, reality is multi-sensory. Um, and I think the VR people are, are starting to recognize they have to do other stuff because if you want to simulate driving, um, and we, we've played with this a little bit, Um, feeling the vibrations makes it a much more immersive experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't try this at home. Um, But, you know, we we can give you a very small version of that. And further, um, we have the technology not just to say, hey, there's a vibration, but to add directionality to that vibration to make it feel like it's coming from in front of you to the left or behind you to the right. Um, there's, we think there's also really interesting potential applications, um, in the sort of e-health, I think people are calling this space, um, Mm -hmm. market, um, and, uh, people are trying to help with things like meditation and relaxation. Um, and my admittedly limited understanding of how all this stuff works, uh, is that one of the things that people try to do is, is to try and encourage your brain to shift from what are called beta waves, which are relatively fast waves inside your brain, to alpha waves, which are slower waves and uh, are associated with being in a more relaxed meditative state. Um, and there are devices out there um, that are designed to measure that uh, the thing you put on your head and it it, it, it gives you sort of biofeedback to tell you when you're in that more relaxed state, but it doesn't actually help you get there. It just tells you when you've gotten there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are people working on ways to try and actually get you there. And, and the technology they've used is something called brainwave entrainment. Um, and it's essentially trying to broadcast alpha waves into your head to try and get your brain to align with them. And apparently they've had some, uh, some success with this. Um, now the problem is that the way with normal acoustic drivers that they've been able to do this um, is with what, um, what are sometimes called difference tones. Um, I don't know if this will, will play with our, with our setup, but maybe we can add it later if it doesn't, but the way they get say, a 15 Hertz tone into your head is to play a 150 Hertz tone in your left ear and 135 Hertz tone in your right ear. Mm -hmm. Um, And your, your brain in effect synthesizes the difference. Uh, Whoops. Hang on. The problem is it sounds like, can you hear it? Yeah. Um, It sounds awful. (laughs) It's really annoying. 
Um, and so when they do this, they like bury it in music where it's not even clear that you're, that you're sensing it because it's just so annoying to listen to that. Well, mm -hmm. We can bypass all that because we can just play that 15 hertz tone directly in a way that's actually kind of pleasing. It's a little bit of a massage on your head um, and no annoying difference tones. Okay. Um, there's other interesting things, interesting applications for this as well, but I've droned on long enough here. I think the, the short version is that we're more powerful than the other devices. We go deeper. Um, we have faster rise times, flatter frequency response. Um, and of course we've got a bunch of IP on it, but, uh, that was the story I was hoping to share. So thank you. Okay. Very, very interesting. Um, Let me have a go if you don't mind, John, what size is it? It's roughly, uh, 40 centimeters by 40, I'm sorry, 47, 40 millimeters by 47 millimeters by six millimeters, I believe, or eight millimeters. I'm not sure, but it has, it, it's not the same depth at every point because there's a coil sticking out on one side. Okay. Okay. So that's that, a rough dimension. Did you say six to eight millimeters of thickness? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it fits very comfortably in most over ear headphone cups. And you, um, uh, on one surface, you uh, hard mount it to the ear cup shell and the other surface is floating. Exactly. Yeah. Well, when you say surface, there's a, there's a mass inside. We, I, I can go back to the picture if you want to see it. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's adhered to a surface of the plastic somewhere. And um, um, yeah, the, the frame mounts to the cup and there's a mass that vibrates inside uh, that moves freely. Okay, and uh, you probably don't need very much clear space behind it, just a millimeter. Exactly. Or so. okay. um, we well, because we're not, um, because it's not an acoustic driver, it can be. You don't, you, we don't need any clear space. Um, yeah. You you could you could completely seal it in if you wanted to. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, yes, it's sealed in, but it still has some amount of travel, I guess. But it's inside the frame, so you oh, okay, okay, outside. Okay, 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 okay. The uh, yeah, and um, uh, we were talking about the direction X Y Z uh, part of it. Uh, yes, you have to mount it on because you can't have a forty millimeter kind of surface area facing that direction. You you mount it in this plane. Yes, correct. Yeah, okay, and um, <clears throat> and how much power supply do you need, or what drive? What do you drive it with? Um, so, uh, three to five volts, I believe is the, is the drive signal that we use. Um, the Corsair HS60 is a, is a USB headphone. So we're, we're, um, yep. we're getting the, uh, the drive voltage off of the USB connection. Okay. Okay. And, um, how much power do you need? So that number I don't have off the top of my head. Okay. Um, okay. We can put it in afterwards. I, I saw something in a slide. It's not low, so you probably, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, over uh, averaged over time if it's, um, if it's not. It, yeah. It, so the the first headphone that we that we did um, at Taction, which was a thing we did on Kickstarter, just sort of to get going, um, was battery powered. Um, and was not USB. It had a you know an anal uh, a standard three point five millimeter analog, and we had a five hundred milliamp battery, one one on each cup for balance, um, yep. and that yep. would give, depending upon duty cycles and intensity and all that, um, anywhere from I think eight to sixteen hours of runtime. Okay. Any uh, requirements or recommendations for the ear pad? Because ultimately, this uh, tactile sensation is going to travel through the ear pad, I guess. Um, yeah, that's absolutely something where we work, we think the best approach is for us to work with a partner to help them, uh, choose the right, uh, kind of cushion there. Um, cause you're absolutely right, Simon, that it has a real effect on how much, um, how much vibration at different frequencies gets, um, yeah. transmitted to the skin. You want to try and get as much surface area as you can to really, uh, get the feeling of, you don't want to, you don't want a thin needle point just vibrating on your cheek, I think. Well, so um, we're, we're, we're threatening to fall off the edge of my expertise here. Okay. Um, but uh, 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 what I would say is you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, if you reduce it to sort of, a, you know, uh, uh, a needle point, all the pressure from the headphone cup on a needle point 
Um, it would probably be very unpleasant. Um, there's, I think, a little bit of a trade-off once you get sort of into the into the range of surface areas that's sort of standard for an over-the-ear headphone cup, um, where on the one hand, the more of your skin is being contacted by the earphone, the more nerves in effect you're recruiting to transmit the, the sensation. Um, but you're also distributing the force over a larger area and maybe it's less force and, um, you know, less force per unit of skin. And I'm completely out of my depth now. So I'll stop. So, um, uh, uh, the way it was presented, it looks as though you're trying to avoid acoustic, uh, generating acoustic signals from it. You really just, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, and, but, yeah, we, we think that's very important. Um, and, uh, uh, the output of the transducer um, to some degree mechanically also obviously in filter tuning um, can be adjusted in order to pair with, you know, a, a, a given headphone because um, there's a wide range of um, sort of power outputs in, in the acoustic, in, in the base acoustic base area for, for um, over your headphones, you know, uh, open back, close back, diff different tunings, et cetera. And in all these cases that you're delivering the uh, input audio signal to the device, do you do some additional filtering or something like that? Yes, we, there's, there is definitely a bunch of DSP going on. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't want to get into all the details on that, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a public forum, but um, uh, we are, um, the, the, the signal is processed digitally and there's a bunch of, uh, manipulation, shall we say, that we do in order to pair it most effectively with the acoustic signal. Okay, so uh, if I wanted to implement it in a headphone, uh, you've got the device plus you're gonna need another board, a DSP amplifier board to go with it. It depends upon what you have. If you have, if we're talking about a purely analog headphone, then absolutely, yes, you would need yep. more, uh, more electronics. On the other hand, if you have um, a USB headphone, it is certainly possible that we can fit what we do into, uh, into the chips you already have in your headphone. Yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. most USB controller or Bluetooth would probably have enough DSP horsepower to, to do the filtering that you guys need to make your system work. Yeah. The, the, the you know, the, we're, <laughs> we're doing, we're doing some fancy footwork, but the really good news from a processing standpoint is it's all at very low frequencies. So um, it's not terribly demanding from a, uh, from a microprocessor standpoint. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of horsepower in these little devices nowadays. It's, so it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. You know, as, as a, as somebody who goes back to the earliest PC days, uh, <laughs> the, the, the level of processing power in these tiny little things just blows me away still. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to date myself, but I had a, a, a Mac in, in 1992 in high school, and we were astounded that we could get 8-bit sampling for four seconds. <laughs> so, see, uh, everything um, with computers has accelerated. So you're, you're not dating yourself uh, <laughs> uh, there, Dave. I, my first experience with computer music was in college and it was on a mainframe that could only run at night when no one else was using the computer and it had to be done in batch mode. There was no real time. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this seems like something that, you know, ultimately could be also like a, a, a hearing protection type thing because we're going to use a haptic motor to enhance the bass rather than kids cranking up the volume to feel the bass more. So that's a, a kind of an interesting scope of things, but definitely for gaming. One more point on my side, Dave, before you wrap it up, which sounds like you're leading to. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what we've been talking about is, um, uh, you know, especially for gaming, it's quite important, but uh, equally it could be just for uh, audio for music listening. Uh, what about this application? Can it also serve the function of when you have a touch uh, sensor on your headphone, you can get a, a blip out of that? Because normally when I hear haptics, I'm thinking uh, touch haptics on a phone or on buttons, but you're actually talking about a, a audio sensation haptic. So you, you, let me make sure I understand what you're, what you're asking, Simon. So that, for example, if, um, if there's gesture control in the headphone, yes, sir, sir. Um, 
yeah. by, like some of the Sony uh, noise yeah. canceling ones where you touch it to um, to let in outside sound and that sort of thing. Could it give exactly. touch feedback? Is that yeah, absolutely yes? Yeah. It's yeah. it's not yeah. something we've thought about, but it would absolutely work. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, but <laughs> before before Dave hooks me out of here, um, yeah, yeah, what you were saying about uh, um, the 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 um, volume levels again. This is something where we've done some small scale testing. Uh, people tend to listen way too loud, cause a bunch of hearing damage over time because they're trying to get that excitement in their music. And because the bass, the tactile bass is missing, they just keep turning it up in order to uh, substitute for that. And our own testing shows that yes, people do listen um, at lower volume levels when you make this available to them. And, you know, in Europe, they're trying to limit output of headphones. And so in, in effect, we can replace what the lower volume level is taken away. All right. Very good. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today, John. Thanks for Simon for being here as always with the good questions. So, um, everybody, um, we'll put the content, uh, links below for everybody to reach out and find out more information about Taxion. And of course, like subscribe, share, and hit the notification bell. And, um, yeah. So thanks everybody for watching and thanks John for joining. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Okay. Good to talk to you. Bye, everybody. Bye.